Great. Okay. Hi. Welcome, everybody. I'm going to stop my screen share. Uh, to the second half of the 2022 BREP seminar series. My name is Tamala, and I'm part of the organizing committee here. And we're so grateful for everyone's particip participation, but also just coming along and listening in. We've had some great presentations. Um, today's session is being recorded, like I said, will be available via the BREPS website and our social media platforms, so you can go there to get access to the, today's recording. Um, we've had some wonderful presentations, and today's promises to be the same. I'm going to hand over to Chris Jones from the Environmental Psychology Research Group at the University of Surrey. Welcome, Chris. Thank you very much, Tamala. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, I won't speak for too long because I'm basically here just to introduce Begita, who's going to tell us a little bit more about the Environmental Psychology Research Group at Surrey, a bit about the history of, of where we've come from and where we are now. Um, after Begita's spoken for a few minutes, uh, we're going to then have uh, three spotlight presentations. So they're going to be from Melissa Marcel, Ellie Ratcliffe and, and myself. We'll be highlighting a bit more about what we specifically do in terms of research and what we sort of find interesting. Um, and then at the end, hopefully there'll be a bit of time for some, some questions and discussion based upon the, the presentation. So if you do have questions relating to any of the, the presentations which are happening, please do uh, jot those down in the, the, the chat function at the bottom of your screen. And those will be being monitored and uh, we will sort of field those questions at the end. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll hand over to Begita, who is the head of the EPRG at Surrey, and she will give you a bit of a, a taster as to where we've come from. Thank you, Chris. Okay, I will share my screen. Oh, um, I can't share my screen. It's apparently disabled by the host. Is that you, Tamala? <laughs> There we go. There you go. Sorry, Bagita. That's all right. Okay. Um, there we go. Can people see my presentation? It says you can. Yes. Yep. It's not full screen though. Okay. Uh, okay. It's a bit slow. I've got it on my other screen. It is thinking, I think, Bagita. I think, oh, it's, yeah. With, this is really complicated, clearly. Um, you should have fed the hamster in the wheel that's powering your computer a bit more. Yeah, <laughs> I think you can see it on presenter rather than full screen, can't you? Yeah, maybe if you click on the wine glass down at the bottom next to the percentage. <laughs> and it's gone. Oh, sorry, this is, how about this one? No, no, this is not going very, very well. Hang on, I'm going to just stop sharing and unplug it. <laughs> This is the, oh no, I can't do that, sorry. Sorry about this. So at the EPRG, we are masters of new technologies. Yeah, um, this is what you get when you've been around for far too long. <laughs> too many changes in all the technology. Uh, and now, uh, there we go. Let's see. What can you see now? There you go. Perfect. Right. Perfect. Environment psychology. Oh, sorry. Okay. I'll try not to take too long. So I might rush through some of the slides uh, because I have far too much information on them. Um, but what I wanted to do is, uh, like Chris said, give you a bit of a flavor of the history of environment psychology. Obviously, I'll talk about Surrey, but actually, I will um, hopefully give you a bit of a broader flavor of the history of environmental psychology uh, and where I think it has been and where it's going. Uh, now, so there we go. So, there we go. Second slide. There we go. Um, so I don't actually need to tell you what environmental psychology is because you all know this. This is on our website, and obviously, what we do is explore the transactions between people and their physical environment. And I think that perception of what environmental psychology is and does has changed quite a lot over time uh, since the 1970s. So. This is what I would like to give you a little bit of a flavor of. So environment psychology really in, uh, sorry, started in the 1970s, um, where when we had actually University of Surrey was really quite new at the time. Uh, and then we had uh, Terence Lee, we got as a head of department in psychology. He had done his PhD in Cambridge and he then um, he works on schemata, he was a cognitive psychologist, but he was really interested in urban planning. So he started applying this and he ended up apply, uh, 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 not adopting, 
employing uh, various people who really can be perceived as the sort of founding fathers, sadly no mothers, only fathers uh, of environment psychology at Surrey and probably beyond as well. So David Cantor is the obvious person who was employed in 1971. He came home stressed Clyde and he called, he sort of called himself a, a psychologist of architecture. So he launched the idea and the, the, the concept of architectural psychology. He published a very, very well known book called The Theory of Place, which I think he's going to republish very soon, um, even though he's retired ages ago. And he also established the MSc in Environment Psychology in 1973. So I put here, note next year. We have our 50 year anniversary, and I think we're going to plan to do a, a big event or a small event, but with all the past environment psychologists that we have taught. And the MSc is still one of the long, well, it's the longest running, and it's still one of the only type of MSCs of its kind. So there's many more MSCs in environment psychology now, but not that many have still got a focus on both sustainability topics and architectural psychology, and I'll come back to that. So various other people in the 70s joined, Ian Donald, who then later moved to Liverpool, um, like David Cantor did, Pete Stringer, various other names. And if you look these names up, you'll see that they're all associated with classic theories and books and writings in environment psychology. And David Ussel, who's now retired, joined in 1974. So it was all very long time ago. And in the 80s, really, they sort of expanded and developed uh, some of these uh, ideas, environment psychology, further. And David Cantor established the Journal of Environmental Psychology in 1980. Um, so the work that they did at the time was very much related to what we now sort of refer to as the architectural psychology. Um, and that slowly moved towards the late 80s, more towards risk perception and there's an increased acknowledgement and in interest in sort of, well, they didn't call it sustainability issues at the time, but that's what we call it now. So in the eight, early 90s, David Cantor and Ian Donald left. They went to, you know, to University of Liverpool. Um, David Cantor ended up doing crime stuff. Melissa, who is on the call, I can see her there. She can tell you much more about this at some point in the future. Uh, she ended up working with uh, David Cantor after she uh, left here for, from her MSc in environment psychology as well. So in the environmental psychology research group, there was an increasing focus on sustainability and environmental risk. And I joined the group in 1998 on a project that uh, um, uh, was on looking at risk perception of transport generated air pollution and uh, David Ozzo managed to get funding for uh, what was called the Surrey Scholarship. So we were working with local authority to look at risk perception of transport generated air pollution. I also put here that David Ozzo was president of IAPS at the time, uh, which obviously is a, a very important organization I'm sure you're all members of. Um, and I just want to say quickly, sort of say, I don't really like that, to talk about myself that much, but I just want to felt that I quick, should quickly say something about uh, myself before moving on, because I think my history, I guess, my educational history is quite interesting and representative of what environment psychology does. So I studied in the Netherlands. I first did, oh, there's a bit missing. I first, oh, there we go, studied architecture in 1987. And I did it for two years and, and I kept on thinking, what about the people? We're designing lovely buildings, we're creating beautiful spaces, but we're making these places for people. I don't really belong here. So I left architecture after two years. I went to the University of Leiden, uh, where I slowly started to get introduced into the concept of environmental psychology and my project, my final year project was on nature experiences uh, when I started to realize maybe I'm an environment psychologist. I went on to University of Groningen to do my PhD uh, on, inter on sustainability and quality of life where I started thinking well, maybe I am an environment psychologist. I've done looked at both sides of the coin by now. Then I came to Surrey in 1998 uh, where I finally felt that yes, this is where I belong. So obviously I stuck around and I never left. So I've been here for nearly 25 years and I crawled up the ladder as you can see here from lecturer, senior lecturer, et cetera, et cetera. 
And my work is still sort of tying together what I did in Leiden and what I did for my PhD in Groningen, looking at nature engagement uh, and consumer behavior. And I still have very much of an in interest also in the architectural psychology side, of course, because of um, um, my, my background in architecture. So this is what I focus on the MSc is very much like. So in the 2000s, uh, David uh, and I were involved in lots of interdisciplinary, large interdisciplinary research programs that what build on from what I did for my PhD, really. Um, and we had various uh, researchers working with us, like Neef, uh, Murtag, uh, Bokje Abrahamse, um, some of the names you probably have seen before. And we've had lots of visitors. And I think environment psychology is really nice because it's still relatively small. And I think almost everybody knows everybody else, which is great, especially if you've been around for 25 years. Everybody knows us and we know everyone else. So we get lots of visitors, which is really nice. I should also mention that in 1999, we had the first what we called environmental psychology in the UK workshop, which David also always says is the predecessor of BREPS. There were four of those. Uh, the first one was in London, then there was one in Aberdeen, and the last one was in Glasgow, and then it ceased to exist until BREPS took over. Uh, so yeah, which is amazing, of course. Um, and it was really interesting when I look back at this, is that in 2003, uh, myself, uh, Stuart Barr and uh, Patrick Devine Wright, who are now both in Exeter, did a workshop on interdisciplinary research and working in large scale interdisciplinary uh, projects, uh, because we were both, we were all sort of quite struggling with how to do this properly. Uh, and even though now there's much more interest in that at the time, and particularly also during my PhD, this was quite novel working as a social scientist or a psychologist in a, in a large interdisciplinary program. Um, 2010, early in 2010s, David Ozzel retired. Kaylee Wiles joined us, who also did her MSc here at Surrey. Then she came back here after doing a PhD somewhere else. And then she left again. Very sad. Chris Jones left, joined, and now is going to leave as well, which is also very sad. Should have added tears to this. Um, Ellie Radcliffe, however, joined, who also did her, uh, or she did a PhD here at Surrey, and she's still here. So this is good stuff. And just to make sure that people know that people don't leave. This is not normal. Ms. Melissa obviously joined and she's still here as well. Ian Walker has now also joined, which is amazing. And very soon uh, we will also um, be joined by Sarah Payne. I don't know if this is official yet, but there we go. It's now on, on record. Um, and our research is still tapping into a whole range of different environment psychology topics. So we look at place, uh, we look at planning, building, we still we look at a lot of work across environmental restoration, green and blue environments, but also a lot of our work is on sustainability uh, and obviously on uh, understanding energy technologies, but since Chris is leaving, I will not mention this again. <laughs> um, Okay, I'm not going to dwell on this slide. This is all on our website. These are some of the things that we're doing, a whole range of different kinds of topics, research topics related to these different uh, areas. What I wanted to say just a little bit about is that environmental psychology, I think, is really interesting and has always been very applied and interdisciplinary. It works at many, many different scales, like rooms, buildings, neighborhoods, cities, and the global environment. And, and it studies real research with potential real impact. I've put some stuff in here that we've done in our research group, and I'm sure there's many examples across other universities as well. And though that hasn't always been celebrated as much in the psychological sciences, I think, as it has been, uh, as it is now. So now really, as environmental psychologists, I think it's our time to shine both within Surrey and of course across everybody else because of what we do and because it has real meaning. Um, we have a whole range of different research PhD projects. I just put some examples here. I think that's, that's signifying and demonstrate this, this interdisciplinary and also uh, applied focus of, of the work that we're doing. Again, you can spend some time on our website to look at this in a bit more detail. 
And our MSc students go to some of the most amazing places, even though environmental psychology, as obviously all of you know, uh, is not really a protected um, job title. It's increasingly recognized uh, outside in policy and in practice. There's an increasing number of people who know what it is that we're doing, and there's an increasing appreciation of this. Um, so, so I've just given some examples here of where people have gone after they've done the MSc, and of course, some, as I mentioned before, have come back to Surrey, which is amazing. Um, and I think this is a really nice one uh, to, to, I just briefly wanted to show you. So Daniel Iacofano and uh, um, Robin Moore and Susan Golds, uh, Goldsman did their uh, MSc in environmental psychology at Surrey in 1982. Uh, and then they set up a consultancy together in California, which is now like a multi-million pound business. It's a huge business and they're very, very influential. They've done, they're doing some amazing work. And interestingly, they have now put on their website a specific page that shows where they came from uh, and that clearly refers to environmental psychology. I think this is something that's really interesting because this is something you might not have seen necessarily 10 or 15 or 20 years ago. Uh, whereas now it's something that is being celebrated and being an environmental psychologist is, is, is something you can be really proud of. And uh, interesting also, uh, Daniel has come back to survey. We've got really good links with them now uh, to work on some further research projects. Um, if somebody, if I'm taking far too long, Chris, tell me to shut up, please do. <laughs> Otherwise I'll quickly go through my the rest of the A few more minutes, yeah. Okay, excellent. So. Oh, I'm, I'm rounding up anyway, nearly, but I think since the 1970s, there has been a huge growth in environmental psychology at Surrey, but also uh, abroad, outside, uh, outside in the UK, as well as uh, internationally. At Surrey, we're really lucky because our number, staff numbers, of course, have increased, as I've shown you, the MSc num uh, students' uh, numbers in keep on increasing. PhD numbers are increasing and we get increasing numbers of people asking for advice to be involved in research. And our research income has also increased quite substantially. And, and nationally, there's a lot of universities now that where environmental psychologists work who also call themselves environmental psychologists. And internationally, that is the same. There's research and teaching in more and more areas. The number of journals in environmental psychology has increased significantly, especially in the last 10 years, and I can go on. So I think this is the time to be an environmental psychologist. There's an increasing awareness of our importance. So I just wanted to finally mention this project because I think it sort of highlights a lot of this as well. Um, we've recently um, managed to get funding from the SRC to lead environmental social science leadership team in the UK. Uh, we're leading this with Exeter and it's a massive, great big research project. Or it's actually, it's not a research project, it's a knowledge exchange project. Um, and it's, it's meant to draw together all the environmental social sciences across the UK, but actually it's quite a lot of people in there who would probably identify as environmental psychologists. Um, it's a major fund, uh, pro program of work that's been funded uh, at six million pounds. It's going to last five years. Uh, and it's all, like I said, about knowledge exchange. And I think this is really interesting and it highlights what I've tried to say before. It just demonstrates that there's an increasing understanding of the importance of social science more generally, but environmental psychology is more specifically. Uh, to to yeah, get it integrated in interdisciplinary research and also in policy and practice because we really have something very important to say about how to create a better planet for people and for the world. So to conclude, environmental psychologists are very very nice people. This is why we're all so collegial and uh, do things like this. And our our students are wonderful. We're very well connected. We do very useful and interesting and exciting work. And as a, we are increasingly being recognized as important in helping to tackle emerging challenging people environment problems and improve people's health, have climate change, biodiversity challenges and create livable spaces for resilient people. So um, yeah, you can all be very proud to be an environment psychologist. Uh, 
and you're doing very important and wonderful work. And I will leave it there. Thank you. Any questions or do we leave questions to the end? We'll, we'll leave questions to the end. So Perfect. if you've got any questions, please do jot them down. Um, Gita, if you can stop sharing your screen now, what we'll do okay. is move on to uh, have a presentation from one of the people who was mentioned in that last presentation, Melissa Marcel, who uh, is a recent uh, person to join our group. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Melissa and she'll tell you a bit more about her interests in environmental psychology. I, um, I need to unmute myself. <laughs> so uh, can you see my screen? Yep. Yay. OK, great. All right. So I'm um, just going to talk uh, for about 10 minutes about um, the work that environmental psychology can do to address the biodiversity crisis. So it'll be a, a talk of two parts, really. Uh, the first is going to be talking about people's influence on the biodiverse environment. And this comes under the uh, theme of sustainability that we have at the Environmental Psychology Research Group. And then the second part, I'll talk about how biodiversity can influence people's health and well-being. And that comes under the natural environment research strand that we have here at the Environmental Psychology Research Group here at Surrey. So climate change and biodiversity crises are interlinked crises. Um, more and more uh, this year, we're talking about the climate and biodiversity crisis rather than the, the, cl the uh, climate change or the climate crisis. So they're now interlinked. Um, and that's, that means that we need to tackle uh, climate change and biodiversity loss simultaneously or not at all because they impact one another. Um, and human activity is the main cause directly or indirectly of both climate change and biodiversity loss. And therefore, um, the solution lies in changing human behaviors to address both the climate and biodiversity crises. However, behavioral science and like environmental science environmental psychology, conservation psychology, etc., is really not used in nature conservation or biodiversity um, fields. Um, a 0.3% of all papers published in leading conservation journals are related to psychology or behavior change. So nature conservation, uh, biodiversity conservation journals, they're not even, they don't even know about us and what we do and what we can do for them. Um, as such, behavior change interventions for nature conservation often lack any grounding in behavioral science. Ecologists have no idea what they're doing when they design a, um, a behavior change intervention. We need to help them. Therefore, um, you have these perspective articles in uh, Nature Human Behavior and in Biological Conservation about how biodiversity conservation is a promising frontier for behavioral science and, in my opinion, environmental psychologists. Now, there are numerous behavior change theories that can be used to inform behavior change interventions that we as environmental psychologists can draw upon. Um, but it, it's becoming more and more obvious that, you know, hu changing human behavior is really messy and that any one theory is largely insufficient to uh, explain pro-environmental behavior. And so there's now this need for more integrative models of behavior change such as Klockner's Comprehensive Action Determination Model. I like to use the behavior change wheel from Mickey et al. at UCL. And the behavior change wheel links uh, six determinants or sources of behavior to nine different types of interventions to change behavior, which are then supported by seven different policy options. I don't have time to go into the behavior change wheel right now, but if you're interested, there's a lot. Um, they have a whole MSC that you can do uh, about behavior change using the behavior change wheel. But you can use the behavior change wheel to design interventions and policies. You could use it to retrofit the, the wheel to current interventions and policies to, to identify what's inside them that then provides you with an evaluative framework to see how well interventions are or are not working. And you can use the behavior change wheel to structure systematic reviews of evidence. Now I used it uh, just as, as an example in 
for biodiversity conservation. Generally, uh, we have failed to meet one single global biodiversity target in the whole entire world. And I, as an environmental psychologist, are really interested in why, why is that? Um, and I wanted to look at these um, biodiversity conservation policies from a behavioral science lens. And so I looked at um, pollinator conservation policies in the EU. These are policies that England, uh, the Netherlands, France have developed to conserve pollinators. And I applied the behavior change will to these policies to see what kind of behavior change interventions and policies are being mentioned or not. And what we found was that um, in 23% of all interventions mentioned in these documents, they mentioned education. And we know as psychologists that education on its own isn't sufficient to change behavior, but they're leaning hard on it. And what we found is that none of the policies mentioned coercion, which is a behavior change um, type that creates an expectation about costs um, or a punishment in, in, in someone. And that wasn't even mentioned at all in any of these pol policies, but it's highly effective. What we also looked at was uh, what was the target, you know, whose behavior needed to change in these pollinator um, conservation policies, you know, uh, to save pollinators, to save them birds and bees, whose behavior needed to change. And what we found was that in 41% of all um, actions in these policies, did they fail to specify whose behavior needed to change. So if we're, if we're talking about why these um, big, policies fail, I think we can we can start making little little changes by applying this behavioral lens because we could just say, well, you're failing because in 40% of your actions, you don't know who needs to change their behavior. Address that first, right? Um, let's move on. I'm going to talk about biodiversity and its impact on human health real quick. You um, as environmental psychologists, we'll all be aware of the psychological benefits of nature. We have um, research, you know, been done since the 1980s on this, um, but less is known on the restorative benefits of nature about which types or qualities of natural environments are beneficial. Because most of the studies on restorative environments co uh, compare green versus gray, right? Nature versus urban. And so I'm part of um, an expert working group where we're conducting a systematic review looking at which types and qualities of green and blue space have an impact on mental health. Uh, this was published in a World Health Organization report last year. And I'll just highlight here that um, in our systematic review, we found that there were um, about three experimental and five cross-sectional studies that looked at the impact of biodiversity on mental health and well-being. So it's a small but growing research area, and there's a lot of opportunity here to look at biodiversity as a quality aspect of the natural environment on human health. And um, I did this in a scientific reports paper where uh, we looked at street trees the abundance of street trees and also the species richness of them in relationship to antidepressants in a sample of about 10,000 people in Leipzig, Germany. And what we found was that um, the, um, a higher density of street trees 100 meters from the home was associated with less antidepressant prescription rates, although that was marginally significant. And we didn't find that um, street tree density at distances further of the home had any effect, nor did we find that, that um, the species richness of trees mattered for antidepressant prescriptions. So we found that it's the abundance of trees immediately outside the home that really matters. And this has important implications for uh, landscape architects. Um, and uh, urban ecologists, because they can then plant the, whatever tree species are appropriate to live in a harsh urban environment, as long as there are a lot of them around people's homes. Um, finally, how can the relationship between biodiversity and health be explained? I get asked this a lot. You know, we looked at uh, street trees and antidepressants, but what's the mechanism? And so I was, um, I was happy to, uh, 
lead a consortium of experts who are vastly more superior than I am um, into developing a biodiversity uh, and health framework model where we detail what are the mediating pathways through which biodiversity influences human health. I won't go into it now, but I just wanna say that if you're interested in pursuing um, the, the relationship between biodiversity and human health and well-being, that um, you can use this framework model to help identify the variables. So, you know, what's the contact with biodiversity a person is having? What's their exposure? What kind of experience are they having with biodiversity? And then which of these uh, domains of pathways uh, is biodiversity influencing human health? Is it restoring our capacities like attention restoration, or is it building our capacities like encouraging physical activity and um, place attachment? And then finally, I just wanna say, here's the bigger picture and why this is important beyond just my own work, is that um, you may have heard of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change. They do all those reports about how climate change is getting worse, right? Um, there's a similar um, intergovernmental organization for the environment, and it's called IPBES, which is the Intergovernmental Panel for Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. And they do the same thing as IPCC. They put out reports where they synthesize knowledge about the environment. And I'm just going to highlight a bit uh, two here. Uh, one is on people and their impact on the biodiverse environment. IPES is uh, publishing this year. Uh, a, an assessment of values where they look at the multiple values of nature and its benefits for people. Environmental psychologists really aren't involved in these assessments and they should be. Um, a lot of ecologists and uh, in, in people in economics are involved in the values assessment. Um, IPBES just now this year have started a transformative change assessment where they're looking at what are the causes and determinants of uh, biodiversity loss and how can we create transformative change. Environmental psychologists should be involved there. And then lastly, just launched this year as well, um, IPBES have a nexus assessment where they're looking at the interlinkages between biodiversity, water, food, and health. And again, it's an opportunity for us as psychologists to be involved. So that's it. Thank you for your time. Brilliant. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, so again, if, if people have questions, do feel free to drop them in the chat box at the uh, bottom. That will be uh, being monitored, but, or you can just write them down and we can ask them at the end. Uh, so now I'll hand over to Ellie Ratcliffe, who will take you through a bit about what she does uh, within the context of environmental psychology. Thanks, Chris. I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully everyone can see that. Yep. That good? Cool. Okay, so nice to nice to talk to everyone today. Uh, I'm also one of these returners from uh, from the environmental psychology group here at Surrey. So I actually did my PhD here uh, between 2011 and 2015, and then I went away to to do some postdoc research elsewhere. And uh, I loved it so much at Surrey, I, I just had to come back. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the research I do, which is these days primarily around people's relationships with place. Uh, so that encompasses both the built and the natural environment. And so I started off with my PhD research looking primarily at sensory experiences of nature, so particularly bird sounds, which I'll talk a bit about. But one of the things that I found really fascinating within that, that work and what's kind of led me to what I do now is people's associations and memories and attachments to specific environments and how that links to place experience. So that's what I started doing uh, kind of back in 2015, 2016. And more and more these days, I'm looking at well-being in the context of cities and the built environment. And I think one of the, the things that I find really fascinating about environmental psychology is focusing not just on whether or not there's an outcome, so whether or not people are restored or have a benefit to their well-being in a certain place, but their how and the why. So what are the kind of the mechanisms involved in that? And in particular, I really enjoy focusing on the role of the person in these person environment transactions. And I really enjoy using kind of creative and innovative methods to, to do this research. So I, I've moved more and more towards kind of being a mixed methods and primarily qualitative researcher these days, I would say. And just as a little uh, puff for the kind of interesting work we, we do in our teaching on the environmental psychology program at Surrey, uh, in 
one of our recent modules, uh, we had two workshops where we got students to design an environment in a shoebox that had to represent good person environment fit. And there were a really lovely selection of kind of mixture of natural and built environments in some of these projects that students were, were producing. So this is a really beautiful one of one of our students, Tom, uh, who produced a, an environment where there was biodiversity within the built environment. So just a little showcase of the kind of exciting things we do in our teaching, not just in our research. Here. So the work I'm probably most known for or associated with is probably my work on birdsong, and that was actually the focus of my, my PhD all those years ago. And this project actually came about because I happened to see a, an opinion piece in The Guardian back in 2010, where someone from the National Trust wrote about how birdsong might be of benefit uh, to people if they were feeling down in the darkest days of winter. And I read that and I thought, this is a really fascinating idea. And at that time, there wasn't really a whole lot of research on nature sounds being restorative, especially in comparison to the abundance of work on uh, the visual uh, and the visual spatial experiences of nature. So I, I took this kind of project idea and collaborated with the National Trust and we kind of really ran with it. And it seems to be a project that captured the, the public interest. So there was quite a lot of media attention around this project. And it was quite productive in terms of publications as well. I think one of the really nice things about this project was that it enabled more detailed study of the kind of mechanisms around why certain environments and certain environmental stimuli might be restorative. So I've got to dig into the kind of acoustic and aesthetic properties that might relate sounds in nature to restorative experiences. I think one of the most fruitful parts of it was looking at people's associations with bird sounds. So the, the meanings that they attach to the sounds and the memories with particular places and particular people. And that's really kind of the philosophy that's driven my research ever since. How do people's interpretations of environments relate to and inform the, the benefits that they might get from them? So this was a, a lovely project. I don't do so much research these days around birds, apart from throwing out the odd literature review. Um, but it, it was a lovely project to kind of define what my philosophy, I suppose, is my, my approach to environmental psychology. From there, I, I did uh, a year and a half, nearly two years of a postdoc uh, position in Finland with a colleague and a good friend of mine, Kalabi Korpela, who maybe some of you, you know or know of his work. And together we were in really interested to examine um, more around this idea of people's inter interpretations and associations, not just with sounds, but with wider places, particularly favorite places, and how that might inform the restorative value that people find in those places. So we published a few publications uh, looking at how people have particular memories, so particularly relating to time and themselves, their self-identity over time, in the context of their favourite places, and how people having those memories might make them more attached to these places in their lives. And because of that increased attachment, they were able to derive greater restorative benefits or perceived restorative benefits in those places. And more recently, we've been looking at links between uh, restorative environments and preference and trying to understand a bit about the modeling of that. So really my work with Calavi has been very exciting from a kind of wider restorative environments perspective, and particularly linking uh, restorative environments with place attachment and place experience. So before that, there wasn't a huge amount of research linking those two areas of environmental psychology together. And actually, I think that's something within environmental psychology, we're starting to do a bit more, but we still maybe have a way to go in terms of not thinking so much in a kind of silo based way, but trying to integrate these different bodies of work and literature. Very often I find people are beavering away in their own corners, but if we work together and try to develop more integrated models, we might get better outcomes. So I think that's one of the, the key kind of outcomes from, from my work with Calabi in Finland. But we haven't finished there. So this work on place attachment and restoration continues because uh, we have uh, Tamla Anderson in our group. So I'm supervising her PhD and she is one of the, the co-organizers of BREPS. Uh, she has been continuing this work on place attachment and well-being and restoration. So looking really very much at kind of the how of how place attachment develops and how that might inform well-being outcomes. I think one of the really great things she's doing in her project, and I hope Tamla doesn't mind me giving a little plug to her research here, uh, is that she's integrating this with the applied context, so how planners and policymakers implement uh, understanding of 
place and place attachment and its links with well-being. So she's currently doing some really interesting research, analyzing policy documents and planning guidelines. And uh, she's also very keen, I know, on open research. In fact, Tamla won a, a wonderful prize uh, for her poster in our uh, University of Surrey open research event quite recently. So in addition to being a great PhD researcher, she's also very design minded, which is, again, one of the lovely things about environmental psychology. We can integrate design and psychology. And the work I do on place attachment and well-being and restoration is very much embedded within the work of uh, another research group who I still cooperate with. So this is the EnvyWell group based at uh, Dumbledore University in Finland, where, where Calafi is still a professor. So together we have kind of a collective of people who are interested uh, not just in restorative environments and environment and well-being, but favourite places and place attachment. And often that includes the urban environment as well. So I wanted to say just a little bit briefly about a recent paper that together we published at the end of last year in Journal of Environmental Psychology. So this was led by our colleague, Mikel Sulu Perez, uh, and we also had some contributions from uh, Tutti Passanen, who's in Finland, uh, Kate Lee from Australia, Anna Bornioli, who is currently working in the Netherlands, uh, so is Jessica de Bloom, and led also by, by Kalavi Popola, again in Finland. And what we were doing here is trying to understand people's experiences of favourite places, specifically in urban environments, so the cities in which they live. And this was in Finland, the Netherlands, Spain, uh, UK, where else did we have, and Australia. So across these countries, we collected uh, just over data from just over 900, uh, primarily kind of young people, emerging adults, around 18 to 25 years old. We asked them to identify and describe two favorite places in the city or town where they lived. So one was indoors and one was outdoors. We had people rate these places on how restorative they perceived them to be, the extent to which they were attached to those places, and also we included another of, a number of other effective appraisals and, and variables that I won't cover here. But one of the really interesting findings from this study is even though we found kind of typical pattern of results that outdoor places were rated as more restorative, we found that this related quite a lot to people's identity as a person. So if the person was uh, a highly nature oriented person, then as you would expect, they rated their favorite outdoor places more restorative. But there was a significant minority, around one third of the sample, who found more restoration in their favorite indoor place. And those participants tended to be the more urban oriented of our sample. So they were more inclined to identify with city environments. So I think this really shows the value of looking at person factors in study of environment and well-being and moving away from this idea that there's a one size fits all, nature is good for everyone kind of approach. We need to consider what people want and how they identify in terms of their environmental orientation. And in both cases, we found that place attachment was a significant predictor of restoration and restorative perceptions, both indoors and outdoors. So again, this role of people's attachment and bonding to place being important. Maybe we, it's not enough just to say this one generic type of place is good for people. We need to think about their personal connections and associations with those places. And I'll talk just briefly to finish off about uh, another project that I've been working on, which is much more applied. So it's about community empowerment, but it really has a, a lot of links to environmental psychology as well. And this is based uh, in around a, a particular street called Southway, which is in northwest Guildford, near the university here. And it suffers from some physical environmental signs of neglect. So there are issues around littering and parking, maybe neglected areas of planting as well. And I started getting involved in this project to see if maybe there's something we could do with the community to change the physical appearance of the street. So we started off on the project in that particular direction. But through immersing ourselves more and spending more time on the project, we've actually understood that the real issues for the community in this area are not really around how the street itself looks, but it's around kind of relationships, people's sense of agency and empowerment, and the resources that the community has or, or they don't have, in fact, to, to feel like they have some kind of uh, positive impact on the environment. And so something we started off with, or the idea that we started off with was doing some kind of physical intervention to improve the street. But the longer time we spent on this project, we realized that that's not really going to lead to sustainable change. Maybe we need to spend time working with the community, understanding what their needs are and giving them the resources 
and helping to develop more positive relationships. So the first step we've, we've done in this regard is that we ran, ran a, a kind of world or collaboration cafe uh, just a couple of weeks ago where we invited uh, people from the community, kind of people who are in positions of leadership or uh, wanted to advocate for their community to discuss what could be done to make things better, not just in terms of the physical street environment, but in terms of their local community. And what we identified is that there's a lot of really good people and really good ideas going on in the in the community and in the area of Southway, but there's a bit of a lack of direction. People don't know who is doing what. And so instead of simply doing a physical uh, intervention like planting trees or creating some kind of you know art installation, we've discovered that actually maybe we need to help the community networks and empower them to develop uh, clearer relationships between each other. And so this project has kind of evolved from a very physical and environmental approach to more of a kind of community psychology project. And that's quite new for me. That's not really an area that I have so much experience in. But I do think it has really important implications for environmental psychology that maybe we need to not focus only on these individual person environment transactions. But we need to think about community and social relationships as well and how those factor into the decisions and the behaviours that people take in the environment. So that's a, a whistle stop tour of what I'm working on right now. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Ellie. Okay, so I will now share my screen with you and this will be the final presentation uh, from us today, after which if you have questions, we're, we'll be happy to, to field those. Um, just a warning in advance, my, my dog walker is about to arrive at any moment. So I might have to duck out for 30 seconds partway through my presentation, but we'll see where we get to. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm, I'm Chris Jones. I'm a member of the group currently, although as has been mentioned, I will be departing the group this summer to join the University of, of Portsmouth. Um, in terms of what I do, uh, so I'm a social and environmental psychologist. My interests are specifically in the areas of, of pro-environmental behaviour and also technology acceptance. Within the field of pro-environmental behaviour, I'm interested in the inconsistencies that exist in pro-environmental behaviour and therefore how we can make pro-environmental behaviour more consistent. So I'm interested in things like spillover effects and rebound, uh, con the concepts of moral and self-licensing within that context, and more specifically, things like compensatory green beliefs. So these are the beliefs that we have that uh, by doing something pro-environmental, that somehow atones for and makes up for doing something less pro-environmental. So uh, I recycle, therefore it's, it's fine that I fly away on my holidays each year. And this concept of compensatory green beliefs actually stems from uh, the health psychology domain and the concept of compensatory health beliefs. Uh, so these are the beliefs that if you do something healthy, like going for a run, that then compensates for doing something unhealthy, like uh, smoking. And you can see this person on screen doing both simultaneously. Um, my other interests are around uh, technology acceptance, as I mentioned, but particularly with regards to energy technologies. And I work on both sides of the plug socket. So I'm interested in supply side technologies and people's perceptions of power generating infrastructure. Uh, so I've done work around nuclear fission, energy storage technologies, wind power. I'm working uh, with the Eurofusion project currently as well, looking at people's perceptions of, of nuclear fusion as a potential energy option, uh, and working with novel technologies like carbon capture, utilization and storage. But I also work on the demand side as well. So I'm looking at some of the technologies that may help us to live more efficient lives and reduce air, um, energy demand um, uh, within uh, consumers. Uh, and within this space, I've been doing work uh, looking at people's perceptions of smart technologies and smart homes more generally. Um, so you can see on screen a little bit about my history. So I trained at Sheffield. I joined Surrey in 2017. But as, as has been mentioned, I will be sadly departing to Portsmouth uh, in the summer. Um, so I'm going to tell you a bit more about the work that I've been doing around smart homes and smart living. Indeed, the concept of smart homes sits within this broader context of smart living. Uh, what is smart living? Well, this is about trying to uh, give people the opportunity to live differently and hopefully live better. So a large number of innovative solutions coming along, which imply the adoption and use of technology. But this adoption and use of technology should make our lives more efficient, more controllable, should have burgeoning economies, more productive societies and more sustainable societies as well. And this concept of smart living will sort of transcend uh, most aspects of, of our lives from how we live within our homes to how we work at our workplaces and how we also move between our home and our workplaces. 
Um, so ultimately, smart living is going to try and improve standards of living um, while striving for increased efficiencies, uh, having beneficial effects on the economy and reducing our carbon footprints. So this is, this is all good stuff, hopefully, but it does imply the adoption and use of technologies and associated with that, a willingness to share data because it's only by sharing data about how we live our lives that we can hopefully seek to improve how we live our lives. And so smart living implies the adoption and use of technology and a willingness to share data. Now, within the context of smart living, we have this concept of the smart home. What is a smart home? Well, definitions do vary, of course, but what we're talking about uh, in principle is a kind of convenient home setup where our appliances, our devices are all automatically controlled by the environment or can be controlled by uh, residents remotely uh, using uh, mobile phones or other inter internet connected devices. Uh, so effectively, you can get your phone or your iPad and you can control aspects of your home ranging from anything from your sort of security systems through to your temperature, your lighting, and so on and so forth. So you can see on screen there a picture of a, a smart home illustrating some of the things which might actually make up that smart home environment. So controlling these security systems, the lighting, the energy management, and so on and so forth. And indeed, there's a lot of evidence of the smartification of homes already happening. So a number of you probably have an Alexa at home or something along those lines, or have maybe invested in a ring doorbell or maybe you have one of these sort of smart uh, thermostats like a hive or a nest. So these are things, these are technologies which are connected and which will hopefully help us to control our internal home conditions in order to make them more efficient or make them more healthy or just to make living our lives a little bit more easier. Now at the University of Surrey, we are working to demonstrate a new smart home technology or a new smart, smart home product option with a, a company called uh, My Global Home. This is an Innovate funded project. So My Global Home have got this, this new concept for a smart home, which is a modular smart home. So it's smart in as much as it's all interconnected and you can control the, the heating and the lighting and the blinds and so on and so forth from a mobile phone. And it's modular in as much as the internal space is flexible. So you can actually change the internal configuration of the space in order such that it meets your, your changing needs as a resident within that space. And you can see some pictures here on screen of what it looks like roughly. It's a bit like an Ikea showroom. Um, the, the picture in the middle there is quite interesting. So this is the central trunk of the, the housing unit. Uh, it can be used for any number of different purposes, but the one that they have demonstrating currently is as a kind of a home cinema space. So this is quite a funky sort of new look um, uh, building concept. And it is also predicated on being digital, being connected, but also being sustainable. And we are working with this company in order to test the technology, both in terms of how people think about the prospect of living in one of these homes, but also looking at some of the engineering questions around, well, well how does the air quality change within these spaces when people are using them? How can we ensure that the air quality remains within healthy parameters? And we're also looking at, well, more broadly, what leads to demonstration technologies like this, this My Global Home product, uh, succeeding in the marketplace or what leads them to maybe fail. So we're doing a number of different things within this space, but my, my role in this project and Ellie and Begita are part of this as well, is looking at sort of consumer perceptions of smart home living and more specifically this particular product option. And in order to actually investigate this, we've done a number of different um, research activities both qualitative and quantitative. And one of the things we did last year was a citizen's jury. So citizen's jury, um, in essence, what happens here is you put something on trial. In this case, it's the smart home products that we're putting on trial. You have experts give testimony in favor of or against the, the, the product. So we had experts talking about the benefits of smart home living or some of the drawbacks of smart home living. And then you allow your jury, in this case, uh, a sample of the public, to debate and discuss the pros and the cons and to come to some kind of conclusion as to, to what this thing is like. In order to facilitate discussion, we drop in various what I call discussion grenades, controversial statements, which are designed to sort of prompt discussion and debate. You can see two of those on screen here. So we asked our public, well, you know, smart living will require data sharing. You know, this is okay, provided these data can be used to help people live better lives. 
you know, this is a bit of a controversial statement because it's suggesting that, well, you know, you know, there could be benefits to living your life more healthily or more sustainably, but that implies that you have to actually be willing to share data and perhaps quite a lot of data. The second statement perhaps was more controversial. Smart homes could monitor your lifestyle and living environment and identify areas for improvement. So we should be willing to cede control, so give over control to our home to make decisions for us about how we should be living our lives. Again, a controversial statement designed to prompt discussion. So we've got a number of very interesting uh, comments in relation to these, these two discussion grenades. Um, quite interestingly, they tended to cluster around three key themes. So we had a, a first theme, which was around the, the benefits, I guess, of the, this technology and about smart living more generally. The idea that uh, if people were living in smart homes, uh, these homes could be monitored in environments. And so if you had vulnerable populations, elderly people, for example, what, having them in these monitored environments could be quite a good thing. It might allow them to live independent lives for longer and you know, could monitor the situation remotely. And if things were going wrong, well, maybe an alarm could be flagged or maybe you could um, act to intervene in order to help. So, you know, this assisted living concept came out as a positive side of, of smart living and data sharing associated with it. Also, we had a bunch of people who quite like technology within our public and they saw the benefits of sharing data for the development and design of, of new technologies. So if you like technologies, if you like smart technologies, if you're willing to share your data, then the product developers can develop even better smart technologies for you. So that could be a positive associated with this kind of uh, field of smart living. This was though traded off with some more sort of um, trepidatious comments relating to things like data ownership and the need for governance. So, there was a sense that, well, will smart home companies and the companies affiliated with them, well, what are they going to do with the data? Who owns the data? Is it the consumer? Is it the resident of these places who owns the data and thus has control over it? Or is it the smart home company? And if it's a smart home company, well, what are they doing with those data? Are they going to be using them for nefarious purposes or what have you? Mm. So these discussions about data ownership led to discussions about the need for regulation and governance within the sector importance of having sort of government oversight over the sector and what have you. Finally, we had a third theme which related to these issues of trustworthiness, transparency and data quality. So again, mapping to that concept of data ownership um, and who owns data, who controls data, there was a sense that maybe smart home companies wouldn't be that trustworthy. Uh, you know, how can we actually trust these, these companies to use our data for uh, for the public good or for the good of the, the, the consumers rather than looking out for their own bottom line. This led to a desire for transparency, transparency around agreements over data sharing and consent processes, bearing in mind, of course, that as technologies develop and are deployed in, uh, in smart homes, the things you signed up for when you first move in might not be the, the, the things which are there, you know, a year after you've moved in. Maybe the technologies have evolved, maybe the kinds of data which is being collected has evolved. So maybe we need greater transparency around these consent processes and an evolving consent process, uh, processes in order to sort of keep up with the technology. And this then maps to this concept of data quality as well. There was a sense that, OK, so it's all right to share data or some data some of the time, but it has to be for relevant purposes. We shouldn't have a situation where a company is just collecting all data all of the time and is not really using it for, for useful purposes. So that was an interesting discussion around the, the kind of the quality of the data coming from uh, uh, smart home living. So in sum, what did we see? Well, we didn't see much fear about machines taking over. Uh, there was a bit of concern about uh, data sharing or what have you, but um, we did also see some positive things around assisted living. The idea that perhaps these vulnerable populations, elderly individuals might actually benefit quite a lot from living in these smart homes. So a mixed bag, a degree of ambivalence, uh, but that's always quite interesting from a research perspective. Uh, finally, just to end, why is this important? Why am I researching these kinds of things? Well, the attitudes and behaviours of consumers, uh, of, of people generally, the public, are important to the fate of technological design and deployment. You know, if you don't have the public on side, it can be very difficult to deploy the technologies that you have in the real world and make them commercial success. And this is why there's an increasing interest in engaging consumers and publics earlier in the development cycle of, of new technologies and more meaningfully, because people like you and I can and do influence the fate of technologies at a number of different levels and in a number of different ways. For example, at the socio-political level, you know, we can vote in favour of political parties and policies aligned with particular sort of technology development, what have you, we can vote against those. 
uh, by making them more or less successful. Equally, in our roles as, as consumers within the marketplace, if we're buying and using technologies, this can use them to succeed. If we're not buying and using them, well, then they're less likely to succeed. <clears throat> and if we're talking about the introduction of technologies within to a community, again, the views of that community and whether or not the actions that follow are facilitative or inhibitory is going to affect whether or not you can actually construct that thing within that community setting. So it's a very important thing that we should be exploring people's perceptions, attitudes and behaviours in relation to technological design development and deployment. So I will thank you. Um, just as a sort of a parting gesture, really, um, as has been mentioned on a number of occasions, I will be leaving the EPRG in the summer. But uh, Birgitta, I don't think she necessarily said this in exactly these words, but she has implied it that you know, once a member of the EPRG, you're always a member of the EPRG. There is no escape from being a member of it. So I'm, I'm quite happy with that, uh, that situation. And I've enjoyed my time with the EPRG. In terms of the future going forward, I've got a number of other active projects which are about to begin along this, uh, these lines of technology acceptance. So one called GasNet New, which is looking about how we can um, heat and cool homes using the gas network. But, by not putting gas through it. That's in collaboration with people at Birmingham, Nottingham, Loughborough. I'm part of a project called Fever as well, which is looking at developing an off-grid, uh, renewably charged electricity, electric, electrical vehicle charging option technology. That's with other people at Surrey, people at Southampton and Sheffield. And I'm part of the Access Project, which was mentioned by Birgitta earlier. So I shall leave things there, and I will thank you for listening. I realise we are slightly over time. Um,